All right, there we go. So the first officially recorded SDK meeting now. That's exciting. Um, the couple things to go over today is one, the milestones. Uh, I think I mentioned it in chat that there was some shuffling that went on due to discovery in the architecture. Uh, that's what I'm sharing now. Uh, beyond that, we'll mention a little bit about the kits that are in development, kit being just the individual components that we are at a, like developing as a part of this suite of tooling, and then probably end with a little bit talking about the um, code golf going on. I know we have a lot of weird terminology in this project so far, uh, but hopefully it'll all become clear as we move forward. So uh, to start with, this uh, the milestones. We completed the first milestone, and that was submitted that we received payment actually for it. So thanks to the coalition and thanks to everybody who helped coordinate that. Uh, we kind of have put that behind us. We are not done with architecture. And I know we had this discussion on either the coalition call or in some Telegram channels in that the architecture itself is going to be a living document moving forward. We want it to exist in the repository and be able to be something that we can evolve as we move forward. Uh, this tech stack is growing and evolving by its like external of this project, and we need the SDKs to kind of follow suit and be able to adapt and um, keep up in parity. That is uh, one of my personal points of frustration with prior SDKs was that they just they never kept up with how fast the platform itself was moving and how fast the contracts themselves were moving. So this whole project and overall, we want to make sure has the proper foundation set up to keep pace with all of that. So first milestone, that one didn't change, obviously. Um, but beyond that, I think the ordering of many of them did, and the names of them also have to some degree. So that to give a brief overview of what that is and to have this recorded and available. Um, before in, actually, I wonder if I can open milestones two. There we go. Get some comparison to it. We're talking about dates, none of the hours, none of the payments changed. Um, Milestones two and three originally when we proposed this project were data models and API clients. And as we were doing the architecture for this, we realized that it is not one core SDK that's coming out of this project. It's actually going to be three or more that are all independently usable and are all essentially core components of this SDK. And because of that, the data models and the API clients that we were originally planning on doing, which just leveraged the uh, EOSIO core library, as it's currently called, um, those weren't necessarily the next best steps. So flipping back, we've decided that these kits, quote unquote, are the next component that are going to be built. They, the three we have right now are account, contract, and session. Session is. Um, also has a large component that may be broken out for transactions, uh, like the actual performing of a transaction. We're not sure if that's going to live within the session or if it's just going to be its own thing. Um, we're developing it as a part of session, but we recognize that it may be split out into its own functional component that is exclusively for assembling and executing transactions. We'll see where how that goes uh, and how abstract we can make it within the session kit. So um, another one we have talked about internally, but we're not absolutely sure is some sort of history adapter that collates all the different history solutions into one adapter. That may be something that could be a kit in the future. I don't know if it falls within the scope of this project or where that's at. It wasn't uh, originally part of the core, but just to give you an example of what a future kit could be. Um, we're using the word kit because it really is kind of a set of tooling for that specific purpose. The count kit is going to be for um, reading and interacting with an account. Like it is, you know, like let's say it is a, your account or it is your account within an app. It is um, 
your account in a local service or a script or something. It is the way to access the data related to your account without having to explicitly go in and define API call paths, API call parameters, all of that kind of thing. There's a lot of knowledge you need to be able to interact with your account essentially right now as a developer. So the account kit is to abstract away all of the account functionality. The contract kit, on the other hand, is kind of an extension of the account, and it is for accounts with contracts. But there are accounts that have tables, there are accounts that have um, you know, ABIs defined, they have actions that you can perform on them. It is a way to specify a contract and then be able to more easily interact with it. It's gonna be what includes the um, like IDE auto completion and typing and things like that. So that way, if you load a contract into your application and you want to perform an action on that contract, it's going to be intelligent enough to tell you, okay, I am performing, like let's say you're using the EOS IO token contract. It's gonna know that the transfer action takes a from and a to and an amount and an optional memo and kind of guide you through that rather than you just writing freeform JSON into a, you know, some sort of function call. That freeform JSON, again, just like with the account kit forming API call patterns, assumes a lot of um, implicit knowledge. Like they assume you know how to do this stuff. And that really is kind of a blocker for application developers at time because they're like, oh, I want to use my smart contract. And now I need to go learn all the API call patterns. I need to learn all the parameters and how to type them and this kind of stuff. So. And this final kit out of the three that we're starting with right now is the session kit. It is what interfaces with wallets, and it is what currently houses the transact method, the one method where you can pass in various forms of data to assemble, sign, and broadcast the transaction, along with various other points to hook into that process. So like we have some samples already written up, one of them being like a resource provider uh, hook that plugs into the transaction flow. So that way, when you as an application developer say, I want to do a token transfer, and you pass in the token transfer, this hook will know that beforehand, we need to call the API, we need to perform these actions and mutate the transaction before it actually reaches the wallet. Uh, in, the, in the resource provider example, it's appending that no op action, where you know the very light action to act as the first authorizer of the whole transaction to cover the resource costs. So that's the session kit is probably, the session and the contract kit are both the more complicated ones that are gonna have um, pretty wide ranging impacts to the different flows on how you build an application on top of these SDKs. And the account kit is really to abstract account management down to a super simple level uh, for those developers as well, so. Um, and then, so that is this next milestone that we're starting to tackle. Those, the reason I kind of dove into those was that these kits are going to serve as the foundation for what we were calling data models and what we were calling API clients. Uh, they'll still effectively be the same thing, but the kits themselves and having them in place will let us extend them to build, you know, under API clients, we have atomic assets. Atomic assets, data model and API clients are going to benefit very heavily from uh, these kits existing. We're going to be able to extend some of the functionality that they offer to build the Atomic Assets API client or Atomic Assets data model. So all in all, that's why we shuffled the milestones around a little bit. We put the these core components above the kind of a third party extensions so that way we could utilize them within it. Um, the, Overall estimation of completion of the project didn't change. Like I said earlier, the price didn't change, the hours didn't change. It's just the ordering of operations that we're gonna be performing. So, so yeah, that was a, a long spiel as to how things have shifted a little bit. Uh, are there any questions or comments or anything along this reorganization of prior or milestones? Yeah, I have a question, Aaron. Sure. Um, so when you talk about kits, you had mentioned earlier we have three different SDKs. Is, is that what you're referring to as kits? Kind of the is that the equivalent, or are there there are different SDKs and then there are kits. They 
I guess the way I've been talking about it is this whole suite of things is an SDK. And then uh -huh. instead of having it be SDKs with SDKs inside of it, I tried to yeah. come up with a different word. Gotcha. And kits okay. being the last part of software development kits. Yep. I, yeah, it is kind of confusing. But they are all standalone SDKs at the technical level. Right. You, you can import them separately. Type yes. Of. Yeah. Um, yep. and, and my second question was, so there's different levels of abstraction for SDKs and one thing we've run into, and I, I haven't looked at like if there is out there kind of architecture documents and I'd love to do that, but so I'll have to ask this, um, are, you know, and with EOS, like you have the EOS JS and then kind of we built an SDK around that that was very abstracted, right? But we find a lot of our integration customers want to dig down and just use kind of the, the you know, EOS JS library or our FIOJS library. Like, when you talk about things like signature providers or serialization providers, are those all going to be somewhat varied in like the session kit is kind of how that that's sounding? Uh, nothing is explicitly buried away. Uh -huh. um, everything, all, most of all of this is based upon the EOSIO core library we've been working on for the past couple of years. Yeah. Um, so all of that is surfaced up through each of these individual kits. So if if people do want to dig in and build their own or extend some sort of subclass that's within the SDKs, like that's all available and easy to do. Um, it's I would say it's a lot more modular than EOSJS as a base, uh, because like if you look at the signing method of EOSJS, like it is yeah. very much we're going to go through this series of operations and we're going to do these things, and some of those things are also buried kind of as private methods totally. within yep. there. Um, this, on the other hand, you could re-implement everything with the same classes and the same techniques in your own code if you wanted. Gotcha. So and so it's following EOSIO core kind of your that existing library fairly closely. You're just kind of breaking that out. I didn't know kind of how how aligned those were going to be. They this is built on top of EOSIO core. Okay. So core really was uh, just kind of some really really abstract data types. Like it <laughs> core doesn't even have a transact method, but right. you can form a transaction. You can import a private key, and then you can use the private key to sign the digest on the transaction. Yeah. Um, like that's all possible in core. It was just never bundled up as like one function. So this is kind of the layer on top of it where we take some of those common flows and we um, combine them into extendable interfaces that you can then, you know, modify to your heart's content. Gotcha. So the other side of core is kind of the uh, almost the core library underlying it. Then still. With some yeah. Applications. Okay. For that, core data types. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. That helps. Thank you. Yep. Hey, uh, Aaron, I was going I had a question on sure. the uh, account, the contract, and the session. What are the dependencies like between them? Are you going to start to build them all at once? Is there one that has to go first? Are there? Is there sort of like a key dependency on these kits? Like, do you have to do the account first before you could even try to do the session? We think that they are going to have some interdependencies between them, but in terms of development, I don't think the dependencies are actually a blocker. Um, like for the relationship between the session and the account, that we would like for there to be a way, like let's say you have a session, a user has logged in, quote unquote. Um, the session object that you are given should be able to return an account. So that way, you know, it is, it is an account derived from the values within the session, but it is not necessarily dependent on the account. So it may be included as a dependency that's not used specifically. They're more just helpers, kind of like factory helpers, where you could on a session call get account and then it returns you an account kit object. So that is, I think, how we're planning on kind of meshing these together. So that way there are ways to derive one type of kit from the other type of kit. But in terms of development, like that realistically can come towards the end and then be uh, somewhat flexible as it comes through. So in terms of development, we've actually started on all three in some form. Um, and 
we don't believe that one is going to need to be completed before the other. Um, it'll just be like if the account kit is updated, potentially maybe the session kit needs to be updated too. If the session kit is internally using an account, but right as it stands right now, the session kit is actually just using a uh, a permission level uh, type to record who it is that is in that session. You know, like the user that was logged in. So, if I if I could ask you also, Aaron, you sure. mentioned um, about expanding the kits and possibly including sorry, including a history adapter kit. Is is that just something that uh, that's just kind of a thought that's happening right now, or is that something you're maybe thinking about adding into this in the near future? It's a thought right now. Okay. Uh, we haven't wanted to commit added that adding that in yet, but it came okay. up when we were looking at the account uh, kit itself. And one of the things we were put, like toying with on the account kit was get actions and you know, like retrieving that user's most recent transactions. And we're like, does that belong on the account? Is that part of the account or is that part of something that's external, like some sort of history kit? And we're not we're not exactly sure how best to solve that because we have Hyperion, Robo, Diffuse, uh, and plenty of other history solutions that you'd actually need to uh, derive that data from. It's not a native API thing, which I think is what we're trying to limit account down to right now. It's just whatever you can get from the native APIs is what the account kit itself will be able to surface whether that's get account calls get data call or get table row calls or whatever yeah i like the way you frame that and eliminate the native call makes sense yeah and then if potentially what we can do somewhere down the road like we're going to probably get more information on this once we start doing milestone five where a couple of those do have history elements to them like uh, Atomic Assets, I think, has a history element to it, their API service that they offer. Uh, Hyperion definitely does. Robo definitely does. When we get to those, which are going to be most likely, some of them will be extending the contract kit. Some of them will be standalone. Um, but if we can abstract those in a way as to where they're kind of interoperable, then we can talk about potentially wrapping a kit around them. So that way it's, you know, instead of picking I want to use Hyperion or I want to use Robo or whatever, you would just use this one broad umbrella, specify a URL and what type it is, and then it would load the underlying resource required to interact with that interface. It's kind of a, it's a backwards way of standardizing how these APIs return data. But if we have this complex kit where we're like, look at this uh, complicated stuff we have to do to retrieve history data, then maybe we can prioritize actually standardizing the responses from those APIs and make SDK development on that side easier. But that's, as we probably all know, history is one of the giant quagmires of all of this. Yeah, this exactly. But, uh, but you have, you know, like um, the, the established ones are more or less, you know, like pretty um, pretty well documented. So yeah. I do like the idea of having something like maybe even another, you know, like kit, so to speak. Uh, and I do agree, at least with the suggestion of making it separate than the account, because, you know, whether you want to get a transaction by ID, it shouldn't be related to, you know, like the account per se, since this is going to yeah. also, you know, not necessarily just be used for like a UI uh, interaction. So exactly. it just makes much more sense to actually like write a little, you know, Obviously, I'm not saying add it to your mandate, but like down the line to have something where there's a standard, like you said, for history. And then each history provider uh, or people using that history provider can uh, write their own adapter that will confirm, conform to that, whether it's a normal request or a stream. And then, uh, you know, kind of like it just builds like the skeleton that they need to kind of fit into. And then it's everybody's responsibility because it's kind of too much to write one for everyone that appears you know yep no that's exactly what we're thinking so and we have kind of kicked that can down the road just a little bit and we'll probably be reevaluating it as the project gets further 
like maybe early next year, um, as some way to be able to tackle that problem within the scope of the SDKs. So I, I like I said, I don't have any answers right now, but it's definitely kind of, it's already come up a couple times <laughs> as we've been looking at these different elements. So it's it looks like it'll fit within the architecture. Um, it's just not part of it yet. Awesome, thanks. Yep. Any other thoughts on milestones or trajectory um, or questions like that may help come up with feedback? Not, we can uh, kind of move on. I said I'm trying not to take up the whole hour. <laughs> cool. We'll just move on. Um, uh, just one last thing. Sure. Uh, since, since you have that distributable bundle as like a later uh, milestone, I wanted to know, will, will there be like initial versions that we can kind of test and play with, like even if it's just like the session kit, so to speak, and things of the sort? Yeah. Most definitely. Um, yeah, and I can kind of get into that. And this this kind of merges into this next point or this next topic I wanted to bring up was that like the status of the development that we have going on right now. Um, we'd like to be able to release kits independently as alphas or betas or whatever, early releases, however you want to label it. So that way people can start experiencing it and um, help us guide the development of it. The, the session kit, for example, um, that's the one that I've been focused on for the past week or two, uh, whenever I can find free development time. And that one I would like to get as many eyes on as possible because everybody kind of performs transactions differently in their use cases. Um, whether it's uh, a chain has different requirements on like just because it's this specific chain or whether it's this application wants to do something special with transactions or whether it's uh, somebody that's using on-chain data to send off-chain and then do something in some other sort of back-end off-chain service. Like there are just an infinite number of ways to use it. So the earlier we can get it out in the project, the more time there is to collect feedback and kind of evolve how something like the session kit actually uh, lets applications perform transactions. So, and I, I guess I'm debating on whether. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, development. I'm just going to kind of jump into the next topic. Did that kind of answer the question? Yeah, for sure. So, like, cool. answer is basically yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and we've started development on all of the kits uh, to some degree. Some kits are further than other kits right now. Um, the way that we're doing development right now is doing test-driven development. There are unit tests in the libraries. There's code coverage reports. Uh, there's some automatic documentation generation happening on these kits. Um, and we are primarily starting all of this off just by defining all of the interfaces and all of the uh, various components and how they're going to interact with one another. Um, that has, I think the session kit is probably the furthest along right now. Um, the contract kit being next and the account kit, we're still in kind of prototyping phases. So like development in earnest has begun on a lot of these and um, we've kind of divided and conquered on a few of these between the team. Um, I'm primarily leading on the session kit right now. So that's going to be the one that I probably can speak the most in depth on. Uh, Johan, who couldn't attend today due to the whole uh, time zones changing in different parts of the world situation. Um, but he'll be on regularly with us, I think, uh, moving forward. And he's the one that's working primarily on the contract kit and how, and the generation tools around the contract kit, how it's going to be extendable to embed within projects or how it's going to be usable dynamically uh, within an application without any sort of code generation. 
Um, and then Daniel on our side is uh, leading the account side of things. And then we have some other various contributors that'll be feeding into the various kits. It's just architecturally, the, the three of us are kind of architecting each one individually now and then doing PRs to collect feedback and you know find those spots where maybe one of us just wrote the code that wasn't good, but it worked. And somebody else is going to catch that and be like, hey, this, this shouldn't be written this way. Um, but so we're starting on that. We're hoping to start making all of that public soon. The reason it's not super public, right? You could find it if you really tried, but um, it's not super public because we still haven't done anything branding related, which I guess just as a side note, we're hoping that within the next week, two, maybe three at the most, we will have sort of a branding presentation for this call. Uh, where we go over what we're calling it. Here's all the domains we've got, the socials, the here's everything and where it lives and how we're imagining this as sort of a developer marketing initiative, how we'll be able to push that out and get people excited about building apps. Um, so that is coming. And once I think that that's more public, then we'll actually be able to show a lot of this stuff. Um, so yeah, that just quick topic to cover on the call that like we're geeking out over code right now, developments ongoing, things are falling into place. The architecture seems to work uh, well. Like we we think after thinking about this for a couple of years and uh, spending you know most of this year and then the past couple months exclusively focused on architecture of this that we've done so much pre planning that it feels like things are just fitting together and falling into place really well. So then I guess the last point, I'll just kind of merge this into the previous point of development has started is, is that the golf repo that we've started, quote unquote, code golf, it's not code golf in the traditional sense in that we're not trying to make the code as small as possible, but our golf repo where we're trying to define logic from the developer's point of view has been seeing a lot of uptick in activity from our team. So if there are people that want to participate in that side of things, whether it's people on this call or people watching this call in the future, um, there are there's ideation going on there in that we are trying to figure out from, you know, like the person who imports these SDKs and starts using them, what the SDKs look like. And that's what's happening in this golf repo. Um, it's all on GitHub at github.com slash graymass slash golf. It's all happening in the issues and PRs. It's all pseudocode. Nothing actually has to run. It is primarily a method for us to say, this is what we want the developer experience to be. This is how we want to perform transactions. Actually, since we have visual represent representations in this call, I can just load up golf. Um, we can see in the pull requests, like we, this permission management pull request, we have been going a little crazy on trying to figure out the best way in the account kit to define how permissions would be managed on that account. And if you just kind of go through the pull requests, you'll see a bunch of discussion. Like this one is about how would you get a permission and then remove it without having to take that permissions array, iterate through it, match the name of the permission, create a transaction, and then execute a transaction. It's like, OK, maybe we just call git active, and then you call remove on it. We're, we're defining that kind of end user experience to do things like permission management in this specific repository. Um, we're just going through all of the various points on how this could be done. Anybody's welcome to join in the conversation. Anybody's willing, welcome to submit pull requests. If there is a topic that we're not covering, like if you go into the main code base, you can see they're all just numbered. And each number has kind of a topic it's trying to address. Um, I started this one a couple days ago that is how to perform a transaction with a private key. I actually have, uh, actually, is it a pull request? Yeah. Um, it is a pull request open on this specific round where it goes through every JavaScript SDK and performs the same action with 
uh, that transaction. So there's kind of dependencies, you have a common configuration that is this is on all of these tests. And then how do you perform this transaction with this SDK, this one being EOSJS? And so we're going through, and the last one is the session kit. It's like, how do you do this with the session kit? And it shows you how you create a new session and then run transact against the session. If you have thoughts, it's really easy just to be like, I don't like this, and leave your comment on the pull requests. Um, and we're trying to use this to discover edge cases that we might not have otherwise found. Um, you know, there it's in a public forum. You can subscribe to this and use all of this to really shape what the end result for developers is going to be. So this golf is here. We're going to probably start doing some blog posts. Uh, I know I'm going to be on some podcasts in the near future. I'll probably be referencing this in those podcasts. Um, we'll probably tweet about this a couple times coming up. We wanted to figure out the process a little better before we really started inviting community developers in. Um, but we think that it's probably moving fast enough now, whereas if people have the motivation and have the free time and want to get involved, then here's an avenue to do it while the code is kind of still happening in the background. So the way I think I've described this to some of you before, um, when, while we're building the SDKs via test-driven development, we're building really from the bottom up, from the fundamental building blocks up towards what the developer would use. And this golf is that we're approaching it from the top down. So we're, we're looking at pseudocode of what it could be. And then somewhere in the middle from the bottom to the top, we're going to find out that happy middle ground where we actually find the answer that we want to implement. And it'll influence actual software design. So, so yeah, I think that in general was the main topics I wanted to cover on today's call. Um, happy to talk about any of those things. Uh, we know that there will be some branding discussion coming up in a meeting here soon. Otherwise, I am open to questions, comments, concerns. So on the spreadsheet that you showed earlier, mm -hmm. first point, the architecture part uh, has a completion date 10, 15. Mm -hmm. Is there a document that describes this architecture or it's all yeah. transpired from these PRs and yeah? Yeah, uh, I think I shared, I'm going back to Telegram to look for it. Uh, we talked about that on last week meeting I will share it I'll actually reply in the channel I will also share it in chat here oh, and I guess I am now sharing it on the screen so that's good <laughs> um, this was the architecture document we came up with that this Revision one is just living in Google Docs for now, and it will live in the SDKs on GitHub once we have those online. So it shows the package overview. There's dependency charts in here. Uh, it outlines a bunch of things. We're here, we're talking about packages and kits and all these weird terms we've used while describing it. But this was the architecture document that we last updated and we will continue to update this as things change i guess another thing to note is one of the reasons we're starting to record these calls is that we are going to start publishing these on the sdk website as the first form of content for the sdk website uh once so we for the, uh, like um... this is PR of perform a transaction with private key that you might. Mentioned earlier. What was the, I Mr. heard it was transact. about the private key usage PR. Yes. Yeah, each one of those tests ESR core typed, untyped, EOSJS, and this session kit one. Those are all how to perform a simple transaction. 
that's kind of this one is this is like we're the, putting it in here this is in the that session kit is what's supposed to be the Yeah, Did, I'm sorry, I was kind of waiting. I thought there was more. <laughs> the session kit is what's going to have a transact method on it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I got disconnected. Oh, OK. Can you hear me? Yeah, now I can. Yeah, probably for that. Yes, yeah, so I was just asking that, like, in this case, the, the session kit is basically what your, you know, like, uh, what is the suggestion is uh, to use in the new uh, SDK. And uh, like the idea here is that transact takes in like like an object that has like you know it could take action actions options or or how is this gonna work? Yes. Yeah, it kind of acts like the ESJS transact, but it has more possibilities to it. Um, there would be a second parameter that you could pass more things into. This first parameter right here, uh, currently in the the tests, it accepts an action, actions, a whole transaction. And those can either be JSON objects, if you really want to, or they can be uh, EOSIO core typed objects. So that way, we, you know, we already have a serialized version of the transaction. And this transact method also can ingest uh, ESR payloads. So you can pass in uh, either a signing request object from the library or a string version of an ESR payload, and it will be able to transact with all four of those types. Is there a reason you're going to have it as a second parameter? Like ESGS was just assuming the first one's an array of actions, I guess. So like um, you could do that here as well. Um, no, like I mean, like why do you want to have multiple parameters? Maybe I'm missing something, but like, why not just pass on that object, and then you can add any additional uh, options, you know, as part of that, like uh, transact object. You know what I mean? Yes, and I believe it does work that way right now in our early versions. Um, maybe this example is just not clear on that. You should just be able to pass in an action or an array of actions or a JSON representation of a transaction. Um, we looked to maintain compatibility with EOSJS transact without being okay. bound to it. Got it. Yeah, but otherwise you can pass in uh, these objects that you can define the specific types on. Um, Though now that you say that, I'm not sure that that's super valuable. <laughs> I think the reason it works like this is because you could pass in an object like this with, instead of just action, it could be actions, and then it could have an array of actions. And that is like a really bare transaction. Like there's no headers, there's no uh, information about the transaction at all, but it is structurally like a transaction. And I know EOSJS maintains support for that. It kind of looks weird, and it'll template all the headers and all the other additional information that you may need. Um, but we can change that, too, if there's strong enough pushback. I think the reason that we're trying to maintain the EOSJS compatibility is just so that way, when people migrate over, they don't have to modify all of their transaction calls unless they want to unless they see some benefit to switching over. Um, the benefit should come from this top portion of the code where you're going to be able to, in this session, define hooks. Like, I want to do this before the transaction is relayed to the signer, or I want to do this after broadcast. Um, specifically, like IBC, we think, will benefit a lot from the after broadcast hook in that, OK, I've broadcast transaction the transaction to chain A, and now in the after broadcast hook, I can feed in a plugin that um, creates the proof and submits it to transaction B or to yeah, chain B. But we didn't, so that's all going to be part of like under the session versus under, because um, the session to me sounds more like your session with an account 
that Correct. can have multiple transactions. So yep. for example, if I want one of my transactions to have a pre or a post kind of you know other action, it doesn't mean I want to apply that for every transaction in that session. Correct. There is a second parameter on transact that you can specify hooks and uh, a lot of the stuff you could in the session. So, and then anything you specify in the transaction will override what you specified in the session. So maybe you don't right. have IBC on the main session, but when you're doing an IBC call, you pass the IBC hooks in as the second parameter on transact, and it will then only do it for that specific transaction. So transact will just like inherit and allow overrides yep. in a way. Exactly. Cool. Oh, well, that's cool. And since we kind of dove a little bit in on the idea of a session, we don't anticipate that most developers will actually be creating sessions themselves. Sessions will be kind of generated for them in a factory-like setting when the application developer calls a login. So from the kit itself, when you call login, it'll return you a session like this that then inherits the settings from the kit as well. So there's kind of this cascading settings with you being able to override what it does at each point in the cascade. Yeah, but uh, so so that's for like UI implementation, like if you're Correct. interacting with the UI that needs a login. Yep. In that sense, then your session will not have any post or pre, like by default, right? Unless Oh, okay. So, so this is like basically what you would write, like con session, whatever, and then instead of while plugin, you you know you do like new anchor or something, and then here as a dab developer, you can add your post and 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 whatever else you want to apply to every transaction. Correct. Okay, got it. Yeah, it's confusing yep. everything. Yep. And this specific example is a little confusing because. The reason that we're manually creating a session here is so that way this runs on um, like command line. Backend. Yeah. So when you want to do back transactions on a backend service, you would actually, you know, you wouldn't use a login method. You would just literally specify this is kind of a debug uh, wallet provider that we've created, the private key wallet provider, um, where you just pass in a private key and it'll just automatically sign anything that this session was asked to sign. In a UI environment, yeah, you'll have like an anchor plugin or a whatever plugin. And then it'll go through yeah. the flow of prompting and getting the signature and appending it and all that. But for these really simple examples, like when we're just talking about transact, we added this flow in. So I, we actually already had this portion of the code working. Cool. Yeah, I, coming up with some UI examples of a lot of this would also be pretty useful to show the, the whole stack and how you can actually kind of define it from the top at the application configuration level, then how each session inherits from the application configuration level, and then how each transaction inherits from the session level. So, and it, with each point, you being able to override them and create unique functionality should you need it. But yeah, this this yeah, type sounds, of uh, quite flexible. This type of feedback, though, is definitely with how flexible it's going to be. We need to make sure it's done the right way. So, this kind of feedback and like, well, how do you, would you want to do this? Is exactly the kind of stuff we're going to be looking for as we kind of architect this all out as code and interfaces. Cool. Um, any other questions or comments or like other topics we want to jump in on? Cool. Does not sound like it. Um, I guess at that point, or at this point, we could probably call this meeting to an end. And uh, next week, if we have something branding related, which I'm personally super excited to start sharing, um, we can share that on the call. If not, we'll have to evaluate how far we are in development-wise and whether or not we'll have the call next week. We're kind of treating it like I know I mentioned this last week, like how the IBC and 
Faster Finality Group are tackling it, where on a per week basis, we're kind of judging whether there's enough content to actually warrant a meeting. Um, so we will see next week if we have enough to kind of update a report on. And if I say, no, we don't, but you guys want to chat on the call for an hour or whatever, uh, our team will obviously have this hour available. So we can always do something regardless. So cool. Okay. Yep. Well, thank you guys very much for joining in. Uh, I hope you guys are starting to get more excited, uh, nearing my excitement level of how this project is going. Uh, I know that'll probably <laughs> take some time, but yeah, I think that this is heading towards really good things for application developers within the community, at least web application developers. So. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited. It's great to see the progress. Yeah. After talking about it for so long, <laughs> it's cool to see something happening. So super excited. Yeah, it looks great. Thanks, Aaron. Yep. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you guys here soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. See you. Take care.